Unix was the name of an operating system created back in the early 1970s. Today, however, Unix refers to any operating system which imitates that original Unix. In the 1980s, the two most prevalent variants of Unix were called System 5, which was created by AT&T, and BSD, which stands for Berkeley System Distribution, so called because it was created at Berkeley University. Today, the most widely used variants are Linux and Mac OS X, and in distant third place are a few descendants of BSD, including FreeBSD and OpenBSD. As a matter of fact, Mac OS X is itself based upon a descendant of BSD called Darwin. Perhaps the biggest difference among these variants is that whereas Mac OS X is a proprietary operating system, that is, it's a commercial product which you must pay for for each copy, Linux and the BSD variants are all examples of what's called either open source software or free software. This means that the source code for these operating systems is freely distributed such that anyone is allowed to copy and modify them. The other major difference is that whereas Mac OS X has now a quite significant share of the desktop market, Linux and BSD do not. Linux and BSD, in contrast, are very successful as server operating systems. In fact, Linux has the dominant market share even greater than Windows. And Linux is also very widely used for small devices, including embeddable systems like, say, the computer in your car. When it comes to smartphones, the two major players now are Android and iOS. Android is a variant of Linux created by Google, and iOS is a variant of Mac OS X used for the iPhone. So we have all these variants of Unix, and none of them are exactly the same, which creates problems because ideally we would like to be able to create a program and then have it run on all variants of Unix. Basically, what we need is some standard that defines what it means to be a Unix system. So in the late 80s and early 90s, operating system developers got together and created two such standards, one called POSIX, which stands for Portable Operating System Interface for Unix, and one called SUS, or the Single Unix Specification. Today, most variants of Unix more or less conform to both of these standards, though there really is quite a bit of divergence in the details. These standards also fail to entirely solve the problem of portability because they don't really specify everything about a Unix system. They're rather limited in their scope. So there are many features of today's Unix systems which work totally different on different Unix systems, or in some cases exist only on some Unix systems, but not others. In the end, it is possible today to write some programs which will run on any Unix system as long as you stay within the bounds of the two standards. As soon as your code uses platform-specific features, you're probably going to have to do some extra work to get it to run on other platforms. From the perspective of a program, the primary thing which defines an operating system is what system calls it makes available. System calls, as we discussed in an earlier unit, are functions in the operating system code which programs can invoke using a special instruction. These functions are the primary means by which the operating system exposes functionality to programs so that programs can use features of the hardware, like say, read and write data on a storage device or send or receive data across the network. And again, recall that the reason these special functions can only be invoked with a special instruction is that normally when a process executes, it can't read and execute data that's part of the operating system kernel itself. Each process is supposed to run effectively confined to its own box, its own part of memory. The instruction to invoke a system call breaks out of that box. And the way it does that is that in the instruction, you specify the number of the system call you wish to invoke, and that causes the CPU to go and look up an address which corresponds to that number in a special table. What we did not discuss is that actually in most modern operating systems, the kernel code for these system calls, and actually the table for the system calls itself, are placed inside the address space of each process. Usually this is placed at the top of the address space, and the stack starts immediately below it. These pages of the address space are normally marked such that the process itself cannot access them. Only when the process invokes a system call via the special instruction does uh, execution actually jump up to the kernel code. And when a system call is invoked, it uses the stack of the process to place a stack frame for that system call, just like with any other function. The purpose of all this is that it allows system calls to execute in the context of the process which invokes them. And that avoids a context switch meaning we don't have to swap out the memory tables of the current process. We can just leave the memory table for the current process in memory for the duration. Another advantage of this arrangement is that it allows system calls to be naturally interrupted, that is, suspended and then resumed later. 
When we suspend a process, it generally doesn't matter if it's running user code, that is code of the program itself, or if it's running kernel code, a system call. If system calls were to run outside the context of a process, that would make it trickier for the operating system to suspend a process while it's invoking a system call. In our earlier discussion of operating systems, we discussed how a process transitions between a few different states. Most obviously, a process can be running, that is actually being currently executed by a CPU, or it can be waiting, meaning it can be waiting for the scheduler to put it into the running state. While running, a process can also be transitioned into the state of being blocked. While blocked, a process will not be scheduled, so it won't ever run again until it is unblocked and put back into the waiting state. There are a dozen ways in which a process may get blocked. The most common is from invoking certain system calls. For example, as we'll discuss shortly, the system call for reading from a file may block the process. The reason it does this is because most data sources from which we read files, namely storage devices like hard drives, such devices tend to be very slow relative to the CPU, so there's nothing for the process or the system call to do while it's waiting for the data to be read off of that device. So the way the system call works is it tells the operating system, hey, I want that data off of that device. It then blocks the process, and then it's the job of the operating system to, once the data is ready, unblock the process. So that's the general pattern. A process gets blocked when it has to wait for something, and then either the operating system or some other process will then signal that process to unblock it. And try not to get confused that blocking effectively means waiting, but what we call waiting refers to waiting to be scheduled and ready to be scheduled. So a blocked process waits for some trigger, and then it waits again in the so-called waiting state. So system calls effectively represent the functionality of the operating system exposed to programs. This includes system calls for, first of all, managing processes themselves, such as, say, from one process, starting another process so that we can run another program. And then there are many system calls for dealing with files, creating files, deleting files, reading them, writing them, etc. And then Unix has system calls for what it calls sockets. A socket represents one end of a network connection. So when you want a program to talk to another program on another system, you create a socket in your program, and that socket communicates with the socket in the other program, and that's the channel of communication. Linux also has system calls for what it calls signals. A signal is basically a notification of some event or some condition sent from the operating system or process to some process. Many of the signals sent by the operating system indicate some kind of error condition. Like, for example, when your program causes a memory violation, that is, it reads or writes some byte of memory it's not allowed to, recall from our earlier unit that that will trigger a hardware exception in the CPU, causing the CPU to go and execute a pre-designated piece of operating system code, and that operating system code will send a signal to our process indicating the error. And when the process receives that signal, it gets interrupted, and it will execute a function pre-designated to run for when that process receives that signal. Unixes also have many system calls for what's generically called inter-process communication, meaning just some kind of mechanism for processes to communicate with each other. Actually, network sockets are one form of uh, inter-process communication because, in fact, when a process communicates over a socket, the other program doesn't have to be on another system. It can actually be another process on the same system. But for communication between processes actually running on the very same system, uh, we have some additional mechanisms which generally have the advantage of being more efficient. Unix systems also have a surprising number of system calls just for dealing with what are called terminals. Terminals and command line shells are something we'll talk about in the next unit. Today's Unixes also have system calls for what are called threads. When a process runs, by default it has one thread of execution. That is, there's one code pointer, there's one pointer pointing to what the current instruction is, and there's one stack keeping track of all the functions that we've invoked. With multiple threads of execution, you can effectively split a process into separate threads, each thread having its own code pointer and its own stack. The simplest way to think about threads is that they are like separate processes, which run independently and are scheduled independently, but they share the same address space. So the data on the heap can be read and written by any thread in the process. All of the reasons you might have to make your program multi-threaded, and all of the difficult problems that arise in multi-threaded programming, we'll discuss in a later unit.
Finally, we have system calls for talking to I.O. devices. That is everything from the system clock to the video adapter to uh, storage devices. Though actually, of course, in the case of storage devices, we generally read and write data to them in the form of files. And actually, as we'll see, Unixes allow us to treat I.O. devices like files, which admittedly is a very baffling thing to hear. What it really comes down to is that when it comes to reading and writing data from an I.O. device, we can, in most cases, use the same system calls that we use to read and write files. So in that sense, we can treat I.O. devices in Unix like files. Now, in this unit, we're mainly going to focus on the system calls for managing processes and for reading and writing files, and also a little bit about signals. We're not really going to cover anything about sockets or inter process communication or terminals or threads or even I.O. devices. Though, as I mentioned, there's some overlap between the system calls dealing with files and those dealing with I.O. devices. Now, as I've said, a system call is invoked using a special instruction. The question, though, is, well, if I'm not programming in assembly, how do I invoke that instruction? Well, in the case of the C language, for example, C compiles into machine code. And in C, we can actually write functions in assembly, which we can then invoke from our C code as if it were like a C function. So most implementations of the C language will include, along with just a compiler, will include standard libraries that include these functions, which invoke the system calls. So even though we haven't yet learned the C language, here, for example, is what the read system call, the system call which reads a file, this is what it looks like in C. In the case of interpreted languages, most interpreters are written in C or C++. And so to invoke a system call from your Python code, we need our Python implementation, our Python interpreter, to provide for us some special function which ultimately invokes in C code that system call. And because of semantic differences between the C language and, say, Python, the arguments you provide for these functions don't necessarily correspond exactly to the arguments provided to the system call in C nor do they necessarily return exactly the same kind of value. The function provided to us by Python, the wrapper function, is bridging that semantic gap between the Python language and the C language. So the function, say in Python, which wraps the system call read, might be simplified to say have just one parameter instead of three. The purpose in this unit is to just familiarize you with the most important system calls and to understand what they do, not necessarily how exactly to invoke them. As you'll see in a later unit, the C language has no exception mechanism, so there's a very different way we have to deal with errors. Basically, when we invoke a function, we have to check the return value for some kind of error condition. So when you use standard library functions in C, including these system call functions, you need to learn how to check for and deal with errors for each particular function. In fact, there are generally many things that might go wrong when you invoke a system call. For example, when you attempt to open a file so you can read or write that file, what if the file doesn't exist? Well, then the function, the system call, has to return some kind of error, and you need to learn to check for those kinds of errors. In truth, you should almost think of invoking a system call as more like making a request than making a demand. You're asking the operating system to do something, and for various reasons, depending upon what system call you invoked, the operating system may or may not oblige your request. While the possibility of errors is in practice, of course, very important, it's not something you can simply ignore, for our purposes here, we're just going to pretend that errors don't exist. We're just going to elide over all of those details. As for the code examples in this unit, they're all going to be kept uh, exceedingly short, and they're not actually going to be written in any proper programming language. They're going to be written in something that looks like Python, but don't imagine it's actual Python code. This is just pseudocode for our purposes here. So let's start by again discussing processes. For every process currently in the system, the operating system keeps a data structure that keeps track of all the things associated with that process. And those things include, first of all, an address space, that is to say, the memory table which is loaded when that process is running. But processes also include a few things which we haven't yet discussed, including user IDs, file descriptors, what's called the environment, which is basically a small amount of data associated with the process. And each process has an associated current directory and a root directory. All of these are things which we'll explain in turn. Looking closer at address spaces, we haven't previously mentioned that most processes include a section for what's called the uninitialized data and one for what's called the initialized data. 
These are sections of memory set aside at the start of a program for storing global variables, the difference being that in the uninitialized section, those global variables don't have any initial values, whereas in the initialized data section, they do. When the operating system loads and executes an executable file, it's the executable file which specifies how large these sections need to be. And the reason we think of initialized globals as different from uninitialized globals is that for every initialized global, that value it has to be somehow stored in the executable, the initial value. Whereas with uninitialized globals, there is no value, so there's nothing to store in the executable. The executable just needs to make note of, hey, we need this much space for additional global variables. That's an important thing to understand. When you create an executable, you're doing so from a compiled language like C. And unlike in Python, where global variables are sort of created in the course of the execution of the program, in C, the, at compilation time, the number of global variables is, is fixed. So you, however many global variables you put in your code, the compiler knows. And so it sets aside enough space in the executable. So these data sections have no need to either shrink or grow in the course of the program. They're always fixed in size. As for the other sections in the process, the code section, which is actually usually called the text section, the code is called the program text, so to speak. The code section is fixed in size, and the code is all loaded at the start of the program. The same is true of the kernel code section. The stack section, in contrast, starts out empty at the start of the program, and in the course of the program, it will grow and shrink. The heap portion of the address space is all the space left in the middle, but to use this space, we have to explicitly allocate it from the operating system. We have to invoke a system call that says, hey, this part of my address space, I want that mapped to actual addresses in memory so that I can use it. If your code attempts to use an address in a portion of the heap which has not been allocated, that triggers a memory error. The CPU, recall, translates every address in an instruction to a corresponding physical address using the memory tables, the current memory tables for that process. And so when an address in an instruction doesn't map to anything in physical memory, that triggers a CPU exception and the CPU runs some operating system code, which then sends a signal to your process saying, hey, there was a memory error. To allocate memory in a process, the process should invoke the mmap system call, mmap short for memory map. And what that does is it adds some number of pages into the process address space and maps those pages to actual addresses in physical memory. The munmap system call does the opposite. It deallocates memory pages from your address space such that they no longer resolve to actual addresses in physical memory and so you can no longer use them. So here, for example, we invoke mmap, and we pass in an argument of how many bytes we would like to allocate. Notice, though, we don't specify which bytes of memory we want, because generally it's left up to the operating system to keep track of all of the chunks in the address space, which are free. And so it's the job of the operating system to find a chunk of 5,000 contiguous bytes somewhere in that address space and allocate it, and then return the address of the first byte of that chunk. So what mmap returns here is a newly allocated chunk of memory somewhere in your address space that has at least 5,000 bytes. Notice I say at least 5,000 because, again, memory is allocated in chunks of pages, and pages are usually something like uh, 4 kilobytes in size. So if you allocate 5,000 bytes, that probably allocated at least 2 pages of the address space. So in fact, you probably could get away with using up to about 8,000 bytes starting at that address, but you shouldn't be making that kind of assumption. You requested 5,000 bytes, so you shouldn't assume that the operating system has given you any more than that. So once you have this allocated chunk and you know what the address of the first byte is, then depending upon your language, you can then manipulate all the bytes in that chunk. You can read and write to them. And then once you're done with that chunk of memory, you no longer need it. You discard it, you remove it from your address space with the M unmap system call by passing to it the address of the first byte of that chunk you previously allocated. Understand that for every chunk of memory you're allocating, the operating system is keeping track of those starting addresses, the first bytes in those chunks, so that later when you call munmap, it can know which chunk of memory you're referring to. It may occur to you that the problem of allocating and deallocating memory from a fixed address space is really quite a tricky problem because what we want to avoid as much as possible is a scenario where we wish to allocate X number of bytes of memory and there's more than X number of bytes available, it's just that those bytes are not necessarily contiguous, so we can't allocate a chunk of that size. 
the allocation request is going to fail in that instance. How to do allocation to avoid that situation as much as possible is actually one of the most studied problems in programming. It's not a trivial problem. What makes it especially difficult is that there's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all solution. Different programs have different patterns of allocation and deallocation. So what some programs do, especially when you write a program, say, in C or C++, is that you may take the allocation problem into your own hands. That is, rather than letting the operating system make these decisions, you can simply, at the start of the program, allocate one big chunk, and then use your own allocation algorithm to hand out sub-portions of that chunk. On the one hand, this does mean that your process is grabbing a large chunk of memory which it isn't all necessarily using. On the other hand, it may enable your program to better use the memory which is allocated for it. Now, a lot of students become unclear about why exactly they need to really give back memory at all. Because especially in trivial programs, when you allocate memory, why should you have to deallocate it before you, your program exits? Because when your program exits and the process terminates, that memory is all given back to the operating system anyway. So it's not really an issue. Despite this, you really should always explicitly deallocate any memory that you allocate. And even if it doesn't really make a difference in small, trivial programs, it, you really should get in the habit. Because what happens in larger programs, especially programs that run for a long time or perhaps use a lot of memory, if you allocate memory you never give back, one, it means you're likely at some point to simply run out of memory. You're not going to have any more space in your address space to allocate more memory. But even if that doesn't happen, you still don't want to keep around memory that you're not actually using anymore because that means no one else can use that memory. Now, actually, on most modern operating systems, we have a virtual memory system, and so any memory that you're not using for a long time is probably just going to get swapped out onto a hard disk, and so it's not really going to be stealing physical RAM from any other process or from, its, from that same process, but it still represents a waste of resources. Now, all the languages we've already looked at are interpreted languages that use garbage collection. That is, we don't have to explicitly allocate any memory or deallocate any memory because it's always done for us. In Python, say, when you create an object, it's up to the interpreter to make sure that there's some place in allocated memory to put it, and it's up to the interpreter to keep track of that object such that when there are no more references pointing to that object, it knows that chunk of memory is no longer used and so possibly can be deallocated. These days, the only major languages where we explicitly allocate memory are, aside from assembly, of course, uh, C and C++. Virtually every other language these days does automatic memory allocation and deallocation for us. The way we create new processes in Unix is really quite surprising. The only way to create a new process is for a process to copy itself. That is to copy its entire address space, to copy all of the other things associated with the process, like the user IDs, the environment, and the file descriptors, and so forth. This is done with the fork system call. When a process invokes the fork system call, a fork of that process, a copy of that process is created. When the fork system call returns, both processes actually pick up precisely at that moment where the fork returns. The only difference in the two processes is what value gets returned from that fork system call. In the newly created process, the fork, the so-called child process, the fork system call returns zero. In the original process, the parent process, the one which invoked fork in the first place, the call to fork returns what's called the process ID of that child process, and we'll discuss process IDs shortly. As it sounds, it's basically just a unique number identifying each process in the system. So in this code example here, we're invoking the fork system call, and then we're testing what value that fork system call returns. And if it's zero, then we know that we are inside the new process, the child process, but otherwise we know we are inside the original process, the parent process. So this if else here has two branches, the first of which will only run in the new process, and the second of which will only run in the original process, the parent. Now, you may be concerned that a fork system call may be very expensive to perform because it will involve copying all of the data in one process over to the new copy of the process, but that's not actually the case. In older Unixes, that actually is what happened, but in newer Unixes, we have virtual memory. So what happens is that we only need to copy the memory table of the process, not all the actual content in memory whereas the contents of a process's address space may be megabytes, if not gigabytes in size, and therefore take a long time if we wanted to copy, the memory tables themselves for a process are really generally very small, something on the order of kilobytes rather than megabytes or gigabytes. 
So for example, say this represents the address space of an existing process, and the pages in memory, as you see, are mapped to portions of RAM, and you may have some number of pages which are actually swapped out to the hard drive, so they're not currently actually in RAM. When we copy the memory table for the new fork, its memory pages are all mapped to the precise same portions of actual physical RAM and pages on the hard drive. So now say address 200 in both processes is pointing to the very same storage, whether in RAM or on the hard drive. So far everything's great, as long as the two processes only read from their memory rather than write to it because we actually want the two processes to henceforth diverge such that when in the new fork we write to memory, that change should only be seen in the new process, not the original process, or vice versa. If you write in the original process, you want that only to be seen in the original process, not the new process. To solve this problem, all of the pages in the new process are marked as copy on write. The copy on write flag indicates that as soon as either process attempts to write to that portion of memory, that page of memory, then that page in memory needs to be copied and the address table of the new process updated to point to that new page. So here, for example, after the fork, these two corresponding portions of the address spaces point to the same page in RAM. And until either process attempts to write to that page, that's just fine because, hey, the data hasn't changed. Why don't we just share the same copy? As soon as either process attempts to write to an address in that page, however, that triggers an exception in the CPU because it detects it in the memory table that, hey, this page has been marked as copy on write. And that then triggers the operating system to, before allowing the write to go through, to actually copy that page and then update the table of the new fork. Now that the fork has its own actual copy of that page, it's okay for writes to go through. So this copy on write scheme allows modern Unixes to very cheaply fork new processes without having to copy a whole bunch of data at the outset. In fact, very typically when you fork a process, only a very small number of pages ever get written to in the whole lifetime of the forked process. So quite often, the system only ends up having to copy a very small minority of all the pages. So the fork system call creates a fork of an existing process but that brings along all of the already loaded code in that process. So you're not really changing the program, you're just splitting an existing program into two separately running copies. To actually load a new program, we use the exec system call, which again, surprisingly, does not actually create a new process. What the exec system call does is actually replace the current program in the process with a new program. And when it does this, the entire address space of the process gets discarded and effectively a new one is created first by loading in the new code from some executable file. So after an exec, your process now has a new code section, a new uninitialized and initialized data sections, no heap section yet, nothing's been allocated yet, and a totally empty stack. And execution of this new program begins at some point designated in the executable file. So when in Unix you wish to start a new program, very unintuitively what you do is you first copy your existing process and then in the fork of that process you call exec to load a new program. Such as here in this example, we're executing the executable file found at slash games slash pong. After the exec, most everything about that process remains the same except for the very big difference that, well, it's a totally new address space with a new program loaded. The process, however, retains most of the other resources of that process, such as the environment and the file descriptors, which we haven't yet discussed. If processes are only created by other processes, well then, where did the first process come from? Well, when a Unix system starts, there's always a first process called the init process, and from there, all other processes descend. Effectively, you end up with this hierarchy of processes, starting with init, and then its children, and in turn their children, and their children, and so forth. And each process that's created is known by a unique ID number, a process ID number, or PID. And init always has the PID of 1, and then any subsequent processes created from there have basically whatever is the next available PID number. Do understand that these process ID numbers can be reused. So, for example, if you have a process with the ID 29, once that process terminates, some subsequently created process might be given the ID number 29. Now, processes can get terminated for a variety of reasons, but when a process chooses to terminate itself, it does so by invoking the exit system call. 
and the reason for the underscore in front is to distinguish this from another function called exit in the C standard library. But in any case, when we invoke the exit system call, we pass in a number called the exit code. The exit code indicates to other programs what happened to this program, why did it exit. And by convention, the exit code 0 is used to indicate that this process terminated normally. Basically, the program was over, so it terminated itself. Other exit codes are generally used to indicate some kind of error. Something went wrong in the program, and some programs will use specific codes to indicate specific errors. So you look in the documentation for that program and say, oh, negative 3 means that the program terminated because it ran out of memory, or something like that. Again, there's no hard and fast rules about what these exit codes mean. It's really up to each individual program to decide what they mean. When a process terminates, the process which can read its exit code is its parent the process from which it was forked. And the most common way for the parent to do this is to invoke the wait system call. When a process invokes the wait system call, it goes into a blocked state until the specified other process, its child process, terminates, at which point the wait system call then returns the exit code from that child. So here again we have a process which is forking itself, and then in the child, the forked off process, it uses the exec system call and hence abandons the current program and loads a new one, the program in the executable file games slash pong. Meanwhile, the parent process invokes the wait system call, passing in the process ID of the child process. Recall that in the parent, fork returns the ID of the new child, the other fork. So the parent sits in a blocked state until the fork, the child, terminates that unblocks the parent and the exit code from the child is returned and assigned to the variable code here. So now the parent process, assuming it knows what exit codes from that program are meant to indicate, it knows what happens. It knows if the program terminated successfully or if something went wrong. What is confusingly called a processes environment it's really just a chunk of data. It's some number of bytes with stuff in it. There is an expectation, however, that the environment is in the form of ASCII text, where each line starts with a variable name and then an equal sign followed by a value. And the value is really just any sequence of text characters. It's every text character immediately after the equal sign, but before the new line character. So a typical environment might look something like this. It has here seven different environment variables, as they are so called. And notice that the variables, by convention, are in all capital letters. The first here is called term, and it has the value x term. The second is shell, and it has the value slash bin slash bash, and so forth. The idea of the environment is that it's some kind of configuration data in the process itself, which is passed down from one process to the next. In fact, the environment is always stored directly in the process itself somewhere on the heap, and the address of its location is always stored as a global variable in the data section. If you wish to read or edit the environment in a process, the C standard library has a few functions for doing so, and you should generally use these functions rather than try and edit the environment directly, because if you edit it incorrectly, you can easily screw up the format. Now, again, the idea of the environment is that it is handed down from one process to the next. So when one process is forked from another, the child receives a copy of the process in the state it was in upon the call to fork. This happens naturally because the environment lives in the address space, and when we fork, then everything in the address space gets copied over. However, we also want the environment in a process to be preserved across a call to exec. So one thing the exec system call actually has to do is copy the environment out of the address space to some temporary location before it wipes the address space and then copy the environment back in to the new address space. Without this special treatment, the environment would get wiped every time we call exec. Processes not only have an associated process ID, they also have an associated user ID, that is, a number which indicates the user which owns this process. The idea behind user accounts is that a user account has an associated set of privileges, and so when a process is owned by a user, it has the privileges of that user and only of that user. What that effectively means is that when you execute certain system calls, those system calls may fail because the user which owns the process does not have the privilege to perform that action. For example, if the user which owns the process does not have the privilege to write to a certain file, then any attempt to write to that file will fail.
In most Unix systems, the accounts on the system are all listed in a file called slash etsy slash password. Etsy is a standard directory, which is sort of a grab bag of things, well, hence the name, but it's mainly for configuration files. The user account, given the ID number 0, is a special account called the root user or the super user. And this user account is special because it's allowed to do anything it wants. So when a process is running with the privileges of the super user account, system calls will never fail for privilege reasons. The super user is always privileged to do anything it wants. Now, somewhat confusingly, associated with each process is not just one user ID, that is the user ID of the owner of the process, but actually three different user IDs. The so-called real ID is the ID of the owner of the process, whereas the effective ID is the ID which actually determines what privileges this process has. And then finally, the saved ID is set by calls to exec to match the effective ID. So the saved ID effectively keeps a record of whatever the effective ID was at the time of the last exec call. Each file and directory, in contrast, is associated with just one user ID, the owner of that directory or file. So here's how the three user IDs of a process can get changed. First of all, the exec system call may change the effective and saved IDs, and it does this when the binary file, the executable file being loaded, has a special flag set on it called the setUID bit. When this flag is on the exec executable file, the effective and saved IDs get set to the user ID of the owner of that executable file. So for example, if I exec the executable slash game slash pong, and that file has the set UID bit set, and let's say it's owned by user 30, then the effective ID and the saved ID in the process will both get set to 30. The most common use for this set UID bit mechanism is that we want a program with non-super user privileges to be able to run a program with super user privileges. So if that program file, that executable file, is owned by the super user and has the set UID bit on, then any time that program is executed, it has the privileges of the super user. The process's user IDs can also be set more directly with the set EUID and set UID system calls. The EUID system call only sets the effective user ID. The limitation with both of these system calls is that for obvious security reasons, only the root user can invoke these system calls to set a process's IDs to anything it wants. Normal processes, processes without super user privileges, can only set the effective ID to match the real ID or the saved ID. Obviously, you wouldn't want to allow any process to give itself any privileges it wants, because then the whole concept of privileges would become meaningless. So consider what happens when a Unix system starts. When the Unix system starts, there's just the one process, the init process. It's owned by the super user, and it runs with super user privileges. The init process then spawns a login process, basically a process that just prompts a human to enter a user account name and the associated password to log in. And again, the login process also runs with super user privileges. Once you successfully log in, the login process spawns a shell process, that is some sort of interface process, uh, either a command line or a graphical user interface, and that shell is owned by your user account, the user who just logged in, and it runs with the limited privileges of your user account. So how exactly do we get these three processes? Well, again, init is the first process run by the system, so it's just started automatically. But from there, init forks itself and then calls exec to run the login program, which upon a successful login will fork itself and then call set UID to set the user IDs to that of the user that just logged in, and then call exec to run the shell. Once a user has a shell, they can then, at the command line or at the graphical user interface, spawn other programs, which will be forks of that shell process itself, and so those processes will inherit the same owner. However, any program which is exec that has the set UID bit set, it's going to run with different privileges. It's going to run with the privileges of whatever user owned that executable. And as mentioned, most commonly this is used to run programs with super user privileges, though that's not always the case. It's actually quite common for some programs when installed on the system to actually create their own user account, and then when that program is run, it is run with the privileges of its own user account. One thing this allows the program is to have some files that are all to itself that no one else can touch except the super user. So just be clear that user accounts, while we commonly think of them as associated with actual people, 
they don't necessarily really have to be associated with anyone or in fact anything. A user account is really just an arbitrary number representing some set of privileges. In addition to user accounts, Unix systems also have a concept of user groups, which are defined in a file called slash etsy slash group. A user group, as the name implies, is simply an association of user accounts. And these groups are non-exclusive, so a single user account can belong to multiple groups, though actually one of the groups associated with the user account is considered its primary group. In addition, files and directories are not just owned by one user, they're also owned by one group. And each process not only has three user IDs, it has three group IDs, the real group ID, the effective group ID, and the saved group ID. And these IDs are all set basically just like with the user IDs, except there's a set GID bit on executable files, and the system calls to directly set these group IDs are called set e GID and set GID. Groups mainly exist so that we can designate a set of user accounts rather than just one user account to have privileges with a file or directory. In truth, groups are actually almost sort of a legacy feature of Unix systems. They're traditionally part of Unix because in the early days, Unix was primarily used as a multi-user system where you had one computer with many different people all logging in through terminals to the same system. And so it was thought Unix needed some sort of inbuilt mechanism to group users together. But for various reasons, that model of computing is really kind of out of date. You typically just don't have Unix systems where a whole bunch of different people are logging into the same system. Everyone has their own system now, changing the paradigm. So the Unix concept of user groups is just not as relevant as it once was. Associated with each file and each directory are actually nine different permissions. These nine permissions are grouped into three so-called classes. There's a user class, a group class, and an other class. And for each class, there is a read permission, a write permission, and an execute permission. R for read, W for write, and X for execute. And each one of these permissions is either on or off, set or unset. And so, for example, when the read permission in the user class is on when it's set, that means that the user which owns that file or directory is allowed to read that file or directory. Which class of permissions applies to a process is determined by the simple rule. If the user ID of the file or directory matches the effective user ID in the process, then the user class applies. If that's not the case, but the group ID of the file or directory matches the effective group ID of the process, then the group class applies. And if that's not the case, then it defaults to the other class. So you first need to understand which class applies in your particular scenario. But the question then is, what exactly do these read, write, and execute permissions mean? Well, in the case of files, it's fairly obvious. When you can read a file, that means you can actually read the bytes of the file, that is its contents. The write permission means you can actually modify the bytes of the file, and you can also expand the file in size or shrink it in size. And the execute permission means that when you call an exec, you can specify that file as the file to exec. Without this permission, the call to exec would fail. In the case of directories, these permissions are a bit less intuitive. The read permission means that you can see all the names of the files and directories which that directory contains. The write permission means you can modify this listing. You can remove or rename any of the files or directories in that directory, or you can add new files and directories into that directory. The execute permission on directories is the most confusing because it really doesn't have much to do with execution. When you don't have execute permission on a directory, that effectively means you can't use that directory in any file path. Any system call with that directory in the file path will fail. So consider, for example, this file path. If we do not have execute permission on the directory taft, then we can't use this file path in any system call. I actually have to add a caveat to that. If the directory without execute permission is the last component of the file path, if we're, that is, if the file path points to that directory itself, then it's OK. It's only when we try to use the directory in a file path to get its stuff inside that directory does it fail. So for the file path slash atom slash taft, the execute permission of taft itself is not relevant. If we had read or write permission on the taft directory, even if we don't have execute permission, we can still read and modify that directory. We just can't actually touch anything which that directory contains. Last thing to note here about file and directory permissions is that by convention, when you see a listing of the content of a directory, 
you'll see the nine permissions listed in this format, where it's the, first the user class, the group class, and the other class, and where the letter is present, that means the permission is on, but where there's a dash instead, that means it's off. So say in the top example here, slash Adam slash Lincoln, that file has the right permission disabled in all three classes. Also by convention, the permissions for a directory will be preceded by the letter D to indicate that this is a directory. The four most basic system calls for dealing with files are open, close, read, and write. Read and write are quite self-evident. Read will copy bytes from the file to memory in your process, whereas write does the opposite. It copies bytes in your process to the file. When reading and writing a file, however, that file has to be open. So first, to work with a file, you invoke the open system call, and you pass in the file path to that file, and open will return what's called a file descriptor. A file descriptor is basically just a number which, in your process, uniquely identifies an open file. So in fact, when you invoke the read and write system calls, you don't pass in a file path, you pass in the file descriptor. When you're done with the file descriptor, you should then pass it to the closed system call. Releasing file descriptors this way is not strictly critical, but it is good practice, because in particularly longer running programs, if you just keep hoarding file descriptors and never giving them back, you're going to run out eventually. Each file descriptor does take up a bit of operating system resources, there's some memory associated with each one. And so it's just good practice to always close files when you're done with them. Now, note here that I've indicated the read and write system calls may block. Now, exactly under which circumstances these system calls will block depends upon the type of the file being read or written and also some options that can be specified when that file was opened. We won't get into too many of those details. In the most common scenario, though, when a file is opened with the default options, the read system call will usually block, whereas the write system call will not. So looking at the write system call, here's what happens in the default case. If we are writing to a file on a storage device, like say a hard drive, the data is not actually directly copied from the process to the hard drive. Instead, the call to write will copy that data from the process to a buffer in memory outside the process and controlled by the operating system. And then from there, the operating system will write the data from the buffer to the actual storage device. Even though this scheme involves copying the data twice, it still makes sense for performance reasons. As we've discussed a bit before, I.O. devices like hard drives are relatively very, very slow compared to the CPU. So we wouldn't want our process to have to sit around and wait while data is being copied to the actual storage device. So if the process only has to write to a buffer in the operating system and then it's left up to the operating system to actually copy the data from that buffer to the storage device, then the write system call can return after the data has been copied to the buffer. It doesn't have to sit around and wait. And the process can then continue and get some work done while that data is being copied out to the actual device. So here's what the use of write might look like in code. Say we want to write to the file uh, slash Alice slash Tim. Well, first we need to open it. And that call to open returns a file descriptor here assigned to F. Then when we call write, we specify the file descriptor so it knows which file we're actually writing to. And then we also pass in the data to write. In this case, let's just say it's an ASCII string where each character represents one byte that's going to be written to the file. So here we call write twice, and the first one writes blah blah to the file, and then the second one writes blah blah blah. We'll talk in a moment how exactly you specify where in a file you wish to read or write. In this case, what's happening is the first write uh, just writes at the start of the file from byte 0, and then the next write gets tacked on after that. So we write five blahs to the file, and we're done with the file, so we close it, because that's good practice. One thing to be clear about with the usual behavior of write is that your process can't really know when the data is actually written to disk, or in fact, if it ever actually is written to disk. You, could, you never actually get verification that it actually happens. In fact, because it's left up to the operating system to do the actual writing to disk, the process which wrote the data doesn't even have to stick around. It's quite possible that the process can terminate before the data is ever actually written to disk. This is problematic for programs which need, with a high degree of certainty, to know that their data has been written properly to disk. A database program, for example, makes data integrity a very high priority. So a database just can't accept letting the operating system handle the actual writing of its data 
without getting any verification that the data was actually properly written. Even if databases can't get 100% guarantee that nothing will ever go wrong with their data, they at the very least need to know when something has gone wrong. So although we won't get into the details of how exactly this is done, there are ways in Unix of writing to a file such that you do get verification that the data was actually written. Just understand that by default, you don't get such an assurance. Now, as for the read system call, like with write, there's an intermediary buffer in the operating system. When a process invokes read, the data is not copied directly from the storage device to the process. First, it is copied into a buffer in the operating system, and then from there, copied to the process. Again, this is done mainly for performance reasons. I.O. devices like hard drives are typically very, very slow relative to the CPU, so it would take a long time if a process had to sit around and wait for the data to actually be read off the hard drive. What makes this different from calls to write, however, is that when you're trying to read data, presumably you really can't do anything until you actually get the data. You can't sit around and wait for the operating system to then get the data later. We need the data now. So the purpose of the read buffer is really quite different. The most common usage pattern when reading from a file is that we wish not to read just a small portion of it, but also the portions in the file which follow. So given the typical performance characteristics of storage devices like hard drives, it makes sense when reading from a file to actually read more than is requested, and then to store it in a read buffer so that subsequent calls to read can read directly from the buffer without having to wait again for data to be read from the hard drive. So typically the first time we read from a file, the read buffer is empty, so our process actually has to block while data is read from the hard drive to the buffer, and then once the data is ready in the buffer, our process is unblocked, at which point the read system call finishes its business by copying the data from the buffer to the actual process. If our process then invokes read again on the same file, it's quite likely the data is already in the buffer, in which case the read system call doesn't need to block. So to put it succinctly, the read system call works by default by first checking the buffer and seeing if the data it wants is already there. If not, the process will block while that data, plus some amount of extra data most likely, is read into the buffer, and then the process will unblock once the data is there in the buffer, at which point the data can then actually be copied into the process. What the use of read might look like in code is this. First we open the file, say slash alice slash tim, that returns a file descriptor which we assign to f, and then we invoke the read system call specifying which file we are reading from, and the read call, whether it blocks or not, will eventually return the data read from the file, and if we're done with that file descriptor, good practice is to release it by passing it to the closed system call. Now the interesting question here is how much data does the call to read return? Well, in fact, how much data gets returned is not up to you. It's left up to read itself to decide how much data to return. When invoking read, you can actually specify the max amount of data you want to return, the maximum number of bytes, but it's left up to read to decide whether or not to return that much or actually less. And again, read works this way basically for performance reasons. Consider, for example, if you invoke read and request 4,000 bytes. Well, if only 2,000 bytes are available in the read buffer, that means your process would have to block to wait for the remaining 2,000 bytes. Read will probably, in this case, decide, rather than have your process block, it'll just return those 2,000 bytes. It's then left up to your program to check how much data was actually returned by read, and then call read again to get the rest. While it is left up to read to decide how much data to return, Read is always guaranteed to return some amount of data when there is data in the file left to be read. So this means that read will only return no data in the special case when you are attempting to read at the very end of the file. So in the cases where you invoke read and there's data left in the file but there's nothing in the buffer, read will not just return nothing. It'll block your process and wait for at least something to be read into the buffer. If read were to return nothing when there's still data left to be read, that would falsely indicate to the program that there's no more data left, that the end of file has been reached. Consider now this code which reads in a whole file and prints all of it. First, of course, we open the file, slash alice slash tim, and we assign the file descriptor to f, and then we read from the file with read f. This call most likely blocks, but eventually it's going to return some amount of data. Unless, of course, the file is actually totally empty, in which case it will return an empty string. 
And so for our loop, we test whether the return data, the string, is not empty. That is, whether its length is not equal to zero. Assuming it's not, we then print that string, and then we want to read more from the file, so we invoke read again and assign it again to data. And unless we've already reached the end of file, that read will return some amount of data, so the condition will once again be true, and we'll go through the loop again. And so we'll keep doing this, you know, every chunk of data we read, we then print. And then eventually we'll reach the end of the file, at which point read will return an empty string. So we'll then leave the loop and then close the file because we're done with it. We haven't yet actually explained how exactly read and write know where in a file you wish to read from or write to. Well, quite simply, when you open a file, with each file descriptor is associated a marker that is basically just a numeric index keeping track of where your next read or next write is going to take place. By default, when you open a file, the marker starts out at the first byte, and each time we do a read or write with that file descriptor, the marker will advance that much into the file. So say if you read five bytes, then the marker will advance by five bytes. Now generally, if you're both reading and writing a file, it probably makes most sense, say you have separate file descriptors with separate markers. So you can use one file descriptor to read and the other to write, and they don't interfere with each other. Now, you may be wondering, what if the marker is at the very end of the file and you wish to write? Or what if it's near the end of the file and the amount of data you're going to write is going to go past the end? What happens? Well, in that case, the file simply expands to accommodate however much data you are writing. So, in fact, if you wish to create a file in Unix, all you do is simply open a file which doesn't yet exist and then start writing to it. The file starts out empty, but each write just adds more data. Now, if you actually wish to shrink a file, that's a different story. We have a system call for that called truncate to which you pass the new size of the file. So if your file is 5,000 bytes in size, if you call truncate with the argument 3,000, that will effectively lop off the last 2,000 bytes, leaving you with a file of those first 3,000 bytes. And actually, even though the name truncate implies it's merely for shrinking files, you can also expand files with truncate, and that effectively adds bytes to the end of the file, and all those bytes will be null bytes. They will be zeroed out until, of course, we actually write something else in their place. Now, of course, in many cases, you don't necessarily want to start out reading or writing at the very start of the file, or for whatever reason, you just want to move the marker. So we can do so with the system call called lseek. The seek part of the name makes sense. You're effectively seeking to some part of the file. Uh, what the L stands for is sort of lost to history. It probably stands for long, as in a long-sized integer, but we can't say for sure. In any case, the name is stuck, and it's called lseek. So when you call lseek, you simply pass in the byte to which you wish to move the marker. If you wish to move the marker to the very end of the file, like say you're going to write to the end of the file to append more stuff, uh, there's a special value you pass in to make it go to the very last byte. Also, it's actually possible to move the marker past the end of the last byte, in which case if you then write, you'll be effectively expanding the size of the file. And all of the bytes in between, uh, past the former end of the file and where you're beginning that new write, those bytes get filled in. They become null bytes, zeroed out bytes. Now, when dealing with file descriptors, it's actually quite important to understand that a file descriptor itself is really just a number in the process used to uniquely identify an underlying data structure, what's called a description. And the description is the thing which actually represents the open file and which contains the marker. This distinction between descriptors and descriptions is important because there are actually circumstances in which the descriptor can get copied, and you end up with two separate descriptors which both point to the same description. So you'd have two separate file descriptors, but they'd share the same underlying file marker. When we call open, however, open always returns a new file descriptor with a new underlying file description. So here, when we open the file slash l slash tim twice, uh, the two file descriptors f and f2 both have separate file markers. So when we write here with f and then read with f2, the read and write are both done at the start of the file because f and f2 have their own markers. Looking at this code may raise a question, and that is, when the read call is invoked, does the data returned reflect the change in the file as written by the previous write? That is, is the data returned going to start with a blah space blah? Well, to answer this question, first we have to look again at how descriptors are connected to the actual files stored on disk. And that is, you have a descriptor which points to a description, 
And when we read or write via a description, we're actually writing to a buffer in the operating system, not directly to or from a file on disk. The key thing to understand is that in most Unixes, including Linux, there's only one buffer no matter how many descriptions are open on the same file. So consider, say, a scenario in which a single file is opened and being used by four different processes. These processes very well may end up reading and writing from overlapping portions of the file, but what happens in each case is that each write ends up just overriding what already was in the buffer, and each read simply reads whatever happens to be in the buffer at that time. And very important to understand is that reads and writes are by default not atomic, meaning when you invoke read or write, it may get interrupted in the middle of copying the data to or from the buffer. And so say here, when we have two writes to the same portion of the file, uh, the data being written there may end up getting interweaved. That is, portions of the data from one call to the right may get overwritten by data from the other call to write, and vice versa. So what we end up with here is not necessarily herp derp overwritten by blah blah, or blah blah overwritten by herp derp, but possibly something resulting from them taking turns overwriting each other. In the case of simultaneous reads, there's generally not a problem, because as long as the data is not changing, then the reads aren't affected by each other. However, if a read is intermingled with the writes, then the changes made to the buffer by the writes may end up changing what data gets read. So the important takeaway here is that, by default in Unix, the file buffers are read and written with no coordination. Now, some programs, like, say, databases, do require exclusive control over a file, and for that purpose there are special mechanisms which we won't get into in this unit. As previously discussed, every file on Unix has an owner, and it has a set of permission bits. That is, it has a read, write, and execute permission for the user, for the group, and for what's called the other class. So when we create a file, how do we set its permissions? Well, we can do so with a strangely named umask system call, which sets the permissions for any file we henceforth create in that process. The reason it's called umask is because there is a so-called mask, a set of bits, each one of which corresponds to the permission bits, and so we configure this bit mask by invoking umask and passing in the new mask we want. Uh, what umask returns is the old mask, the one with the old permissions, in case we're curious what the permissions formerly were. And henceforth, any new file we open and write will be created with the permissions as set in that mask we passed to umask. And these permissions also apply to directories, which we'll talk about creating in a moment. Now, if you wish to modify the permissions of an existing file, the system call for that is called chmod, as in change mode. We invoke it by simply passing in the path of either the file or the directory, and then also the mask of the new permissions we want. Now, of course, it would totally defeat the whole purpose of permissions if any process could change the permissions of any file. So for a call to chmod to be successful, the invoking process effective user ID must be zero, the super user, or it must match the owner of that file or directory. To change the owner of a file or directory, we can invoke chown, as in change owner. And of course, we pass in the path to the file or directory, and we specify the new user and the new group which will own this file. And again, of course, for security purposes, we can't allow just anyone to modify the ownership of a file or directory. So for a call to chown to succeed, the effective user ID of the invoking process must be zero, that is the super user, or it must be the same as the user which owns that file or directory, though in that case chown is only allowed to change the group, so the user passed to chown must match the user which already owns that file or directory. Before discussing how to work with directories, recall that each store's device is divided into possibly one or more partitions. It's within these partitions that files and directories are stored, and within each partition, each file and directory is known simply by what's called an inode number, a number which uniquely identifies a file or a directory within that partition. Always within a partition, you have at least one directory called the root directory, which is always designated inode2. Why inode2? Well, inode1 is used specially for a list that keeps track of all the bad sections in the partition, the parts that are unusable, and inode0 is used specially like a null pointer. It indicates the absence of any file or directory. Now, to be clear, this diagram here is a bit misleading. It seems to imply that directories and files are always stored contiguously, 
that is that their bytes are always written in order in adjacent parts of the partition. But in truth, a file can actually be scattered all throughout a partition in pieces. In any case, to create and remove directories, we have the system calls mkdir as in make directory and rmdir as in remove directory. And so here, for example, mkdir with slash alice slash tim creates a directory called tim in the directory alice. And then if we invoke rmdir with the same file path, it then removes that directory. Now to add files to a directory, you simply create the file. That is, you open the file that doesn't yet exist and start writing to it, and that creates it. What that does exactly is it creates a new file in the partition with its own inode, and then in the directory, it creates an association between an inode and the name of the file. And be clear that files only have names insofar as they are listed in directories. Stored with a file itself is no name whatsoever. Files don't have a concept of names, really. The inode has no name, just a number. Only in directories is there a name associated with an inode. So, in fact, what we can do is we can actually place a single file in multiple directories. Once a file has been created, we can then add it to other directories with the system call link. So, here, for example, we're taking the existing file, slash alice, slash ian, and we're adding that file as another entry in the directory slash ben, giving it the name Jill. So now we have this single file with this one inode that is found with the name Ian in the directory Alice, but also found with the name Jill in the directory Ben. As far as the file is concerned, neither one of these is its true name. They are both equally valid. They're just different listings of the same thing. Now, to remove files from directories, we have the system called unlink. So here say slash Alice slash Ian. This will remove the Ian entry in the directory Alice. Now, stored with each inode is a count of how many times that inode is listed in directories. And so every time an inode gets unlinked from a directory, its link count is decremented. And when that count reaches zero, the file system knows that file can then be discarded. Effectively, that means that the storage area which that file takes up on disk is now free to be overridden for the use of other files and directories. So be clear that unlinking the last link to a file doesn't really delete the file. If for privacy or security reasons you want to make sure that a file is really gone, you should overwrite its entire content with random garbage. To read the contents of a directory, we have the system called getDents, as in get directory entries. First off, we open the directory just like with the file. That returns a file descriptor, which actually points to a directory. And then when we invoke getDents with that file descriptor, it returns some number of entries from that directory. Now, for basically the same reasons as the read system call, we don't know how many entries exactly getDents will return, but it's always guaranteed to return at least one. So when getDents returns zero entries, we know there are no more entries to read. Now, each returned entry is a particular data structure containing, most obviously, an inode and the associated file name, but also the length of that file or directory, and also something indicating the type, that is, whether this is a file or directory, or possibly one of a few different file types which we haven't yet discussed. In Microsoft Windows, which you're probably familiar with, each partition of every storage device on the system is given a drive letter. Like, say, the main hard drive is usually one big partition, which is known as C. So the path to the root directory on that partition is C colon slash. And in Windows, the convention is to use backslashes rather than slashes, though Windows doesn't actually care. It doesn't matter which one you use. In Unix, things work quite differently. Rather than assigning each partition its own drive letter, each partition is mounted to a directory. So first off in any Unix system, when it boots, one partition must get mounted to the root partition, designated with just a single slash. Once mounted, the root directory in that partition is now synonymous with slash. So the file path consisting of just a single forward slash, that is synonymous with the root directory of the partition mounted at slash. Once a partition has been mounted to slash, we can mount additional partitions to directories found on other partitions which are already mounted. So here, for example, we have partition 2 mounted at root, and if we have a directory slash Jessica, a directory which itself is in the root directory of partition 2, then we can mount partition 4 to slash Jessica. Henceforth, slash Jessica now refers to the root directory on partition 4, not the directory in partition 2. The directory Jessica in partition 2 is still there, it's just now effectively hidden. 
we would have to unmount partition 4 if we wanted to get at the underlying directory again. In practice, we generally just don't mount partitions to directories which have stuff in them. Usually we just create empty directories for the purpose of a so-called mount point. In any case, continuing here, if we wish to mount partition 3 to slash Jessica slash Vincent, well, first there must be a directory there, so inside partition 4, inside its root directory, which is now mounted at slash Jessica, we create a directory named Vincent, and then we can mount partition 3 there. Finally, to mount partition 1 at slash Alice slash Tim, well then in partition 2 we're going to have to create a directory Alice, and then inside that a directory Tim, and then we can mount partition 1 there. To mount and unmount partitions, we use the mount and umount system calls. Now, when specifying the directory to which we wish to mount a partition and from which we wish to unmount a partition, it's fairly obvious you provide that as a file path. But as for specifying the partition itself, that's actually specified with a special kind of file, which we won't get into in detail in this unit. Anytime a system call expects a file path, we can express that file path as either what's called an absolute path or as what's called a relative path. In an absolute path, we specify the whole path starting from the root of the system, that is the root directory of the partition mounted at slash. A relative path, in contrast, does not begin with a slash. A relative path is automatically translated into a full absolute path by tacking on in front what's called the current working directory. The current working directory is a directory associated with a process and is set in that process with the chdir, as in change directory, system call. So here, for example, I am setting the current working directory for this process to slash ben slash em. When I then call open with an absolute path, slash alice slash tim, the current working directory is irrelevant. This simply opens slash alice slash tim. In the second call to open here, though, the path specified is relative. So it is actually opening alice slash tim inside the current working directory, which at the moment is slash ben slash ian. So this opens slash ben slash ian slash alice slash tim. What's the point of this? Well, simply in some context, it's more convenient if we don't have to write out full absolute paths. So far, we've only discussed what you might call regular files, that is, files with data on a storage device, and we've discussed directories, which are basically just listings of files in other directories. But Unix also has a number of other things which it also considers to be so-called files. In fact, in the broadest use of the term, directories are considered to be files. These other file things include what are called symbolic links, and also what are called device files, or sometimes special files, and those come in two types, uh, character device files and block device files. And then also we have what are called pipes and sockets. Very briefly, a symbolic link is a file which is written to disk like any other file, but it doesn't have any real content. It just has a link, that is a file path, pointing somewhere else and it's specially marked as a special f kind of file. It's not a regular file, it's a symbolic link file, such that any system call which opens a symbolic link will not open the symbolic link itself, but actually the file pointed to by the symbolic link. In practice, symbolic links are very much like shortcut files in Windows. Device files, as we'll discuss in a moment, represent hardware devices, and they are effectively a clever way for our processes to send and receive data from devices using the same system calls we use to read and write files. These device files don't really represent stored data like a regular file, rather they're more like convenient fictions which appear to act like files. Pipes and sockets are both means for inter-process communication, that is, sending data between processes, the difference being that pipes can only communicate between two processes on the same system, whereas sockets can connect processes on different machines across a network. Again, pipes and sockets, like device files, don't really represent any kind of stored data on a storage device. They really are just sort of a fiction that allows us to do this communication using the same set of system calls we use to read and write files. That's the sense in which these things are considered files. So to create a symbolic link, we have the system call symlink, to which we supply the path to the file or directory to which we wish to create a symbolic link, and then we also provide the path of the symbolic link we wish to create. 
So here this creates a symbolic link slash jill slash ken, which points to the file or directory slash alice slash tim. If we then open that symbolic link, what actually gets opened is the file to which it points, not the symbolic link itself. That's pretty much all there is to symbolic links. They're really not that complicated. Now, as for device files, first recall the basic relationship between the CPU and an I.O. device. Devices typically have some number of registers which the CPU can read and write, and that is how they communicate. There actually isn't any way for the device to force the CPU to read its registers, though some devices may send an interrupt signal to the CPU, which then triggers it to go and execute a pre-designated chunk of code, which then will tell the CPU to, hey, go read these registers. Other than that, the CPU is basically in control. So ultimately, talking to a device means reading and writing its registers. But at the level of processes, we don't want to have to deal with such details. We want to work at a higher level of abstraction. So this level of abstraction is what device files provide for us. A device file is not really a file, but when we open a device file and read from it, we are getting data from the device, and when we write to it, we are sending data to the device. For this to work, though, we need a distinction between what are called block devices and what are called character devices. Very broadly, block devices are generally devices with large storage areas, like, say, a hard drive is naturally a block device. Character devices, in contrast, are the sorts of devices that don't really store much data. Data flows in and data flows out, but the data is not really retained by the device. It's more like acted upon as it flows in and out. Or to think of it another way, with block devices, it makes sense somehow to read and write to specific locations, whereas with character devices, the data simply goes in and out in sequence. You are not specifying where in the device you are reading from or writing to. So looking first at block devices, storage partitions are divided into units called blocks. Like the bytes of RAM, these blocks are numbered from zero, and they're all of a uniform size. Usually the block size on a partition is something which is a multiple of 512. So like, say, 4096 is a typical block size. Also like the bytes of RAM, these blocks have to be each read in their entirety. So say, if you want to read something in a block, you have to read the whole block, you can't just read part of it. And even if you want to write to just a single byte in a block, you actually have to rewrite the whole block. So that usually means you'll have to read out the block to a buffer, modify the portion you want to change, and then copy back the buffer to the block. So when an inode, that is a file or directory, is stored on a partition, it's stored on some number of blocks, and those blocks actually don't have to be contiguous, as I previously mentioned. So say here, if we have an inode 86, which is presumably some file or some directory, uh, it might be stored on blocks here 1, 4, and 6. So one consideration when deciding how big the blocks should be on a partition is if you make them too big, then very small files, like files taking up only a few bytes, are going to end up wasting a lot of space, because files always get stored in whole blocks. You can't have a block that's shared between multiple files. So every file, no matter how small, always takes up at least one block. Now, when it comes to reading and writing files on a block device, as previously mentioned, there's always a buffer involved, and the way it works in most Unixes, including Linux, is that there's a buffer for each block. And as we previously mentioned, no matter how many overlapping reads and writes you have from however many different processes, they're always just reading and writing to the same single buffer. So there's always just one buffer per block. Anytime the buffer gets written to, that block is marked as so-called dirty, meaning that the content in the buffer no longer matches what's actually on the disk so it needs to be copied to the actual storage device. So that explains what happens when we write files to block devices, but what though is a block device file? Well, a block device file is a file which effectively represents the whole storage area of that block device, such that the first byte of the first block is byte zero, and then the last byte of the last block is the last byte in the file. When we write to a partition this way, we are actually circumventing the whole system of files and directories on that partition. This way, we're actually reading and writing the raw bytes themselves. And so, in fact, when we write to a block device like this, we can very easily screw up the files and directories on that partition. Because, of course, when files and directories are stored, uh, there has to be some extra information written that keeps track of how the files and directories are actually written on disk, namely which blocks they occupy and in what order.
So reading and writing a block device through a block device file is not something we normally do, but the capability to do so is usually provided because, well, some programs simply have very special needs. Like, for example, databases, as we mentioned, have special needs when it comes to storing and retrieving data. So a database may, in fact, have a partition like this set inside, which it reads and writes in this manner. Again, though, this is not the usual thing to do, and it probably occurs to you that this is an obvious security hole. Block device files pretty obviously should be given restrictive permissions. You don't want just anyone reading and writing arbitrarily to any partition. Character devices differ from block devices in that, first of all, there's no concept of blocks. So instead of having a buffer for each block, there are actually just two buffers, one for input and one for output. When a process writes to a character device file, it is writing to that device file's output buffer, and when a process reads from a character device file, it is reading from its input buffer. These input and output buffers are usually so called because the character device file usually represents some kind of actual hardware device, and so the input which the device receives, it writes to the input buffer of the device file, and the data written to the output buffer is sent as output to the actual device. So the other big difference here is that not only do character devices have no concept of blocks, they also use a separate buffer for input and output. The explanation for this difference is that the input and output buffers of a character device file are both what are called FIFOs. They are first in, first out buffers. A FIFO is effectively like a line, a queue of people waiting for something. When people join a line, they join at the end of the line, and it's the people at the front of the line that get served next. Likewise, in a FIFO buffer, the bytes that are written to the buffer are appended at the end, and the bytes which are read from the buffer are always read from the front. So to make this absolutely clear, in the case of the input buffer of a character device file, the device will send data to the input buffer, which then gets appended to the end, and then when a process invokes the read system call on that character device file, it reads the bytes at the front of the buffer. Once read, those bytes are then removed from the buffer. Conversely, with the output buffer, data is added when a process writes to the character device file, and the data at the front of the buffer is read by the actual device, and again, once read, the data is removed from the buffer. Now, this is just a logical picture of how a buffer is actually supposed to work. I like to picture it as if, when data is read from a buffer, the remaining data slides forward to the front. But of course, that's not what actually happens, because in practice what that would involve is actually copying all of the data byte by byte each time something's read, and that would be very inefficient. So really what goes on, in the character device file, there's something which keeps track of where the next read in the buffer should occur and where the next append of new data should occur, but those are details handled by the operating system. We don't really have to concern ourselves with them. On the other hand, these buffers are generally capped in size. They of course can't hold an infinite amount of data. So what these caps can mean is that when you write to a buffer, the write may fail because there's not enough space left in the buffer. Aside from that, you really shouldn't have to concern yourself with exactly what's going on in these buffers. Let me reiterate the core difference between block devices and character devices. Block devices are for devices that have some large kind of storage space, and so each buffer for a block device is actually backed by storage space, but character devices generally aren't backed by any storage space. With character devices, typically what's happening is that there's these two buffers in the operating system, which are serving as a channel of communication between processes and some actual device. A device which typically has a small number of registers, but maybe no other storage. So again, character device files are usually for the sort of device which immediately acts upon the data which it receives as output. As we'll see in the next unit, primary examples of character devices include terminals. How exactly character devices get created differs greatly from one Unix to the next. Generally, it's something handled specially by the operating system during boot time. By convention, though, device files should be found in a directory placed at slash dev. Dev, of course, short for device. So here, for example, I'm opening two device files. One is slash dev slash sda1. And sda1, assuming the system follows the usual convention, should refer to the first partition of the first storage device on the system. sd here actually originally stood for SCSI device, but some people have retconned it and now say that it stands for storage device. In any case, a device file representing a partition will of course be a block device file. 
In the second line, we're opening a character device file, LP here standing for the archaic term line printer. So this should be a character device file, which I can send data to, to actually print something out on my printer, assuming I have one. Don't ask me why line printers are numbered starting from zero, but partitions are numbered starting from one. Now that I've opened these two files, I can now work with them, such as, say, reading from them. And notice that I can invoke lseek on the block device file, but I couldn't do the same with a character device file. Character devices have no concept of file markers. So calls to lseek on a character device file won't do anything. It should be fairly obvious what we get when we read from the block device file here. We'll get back whatever data is stored starting at byte 100 on that device. But in the case of a character device, it's less obvious. In the case of a printer, it's obvious why you'd want to send data to the device because you want to print stuff, but understand that you may also need to read from the device to say, check its status. If something's gone wrong with a printer and it's not ready to print, that's something your program would probably want to know. In the dev directory, you'll also find a number of what are called pseudo device files. These are mostly character device files, but they don't represent actual hardware devices. They are simply abstractions provided by the operating system. For example, the pseudo device file slash dev slash zero is a character device which, when read, will simply return an infinite string of nulled bytes, of zeroed out bytes. Similarly, the pseudo device slash dev slash random will return an endless stream of random bytes. And lastly, another commonly used pseudo device file slash dev slash null doesn't return any bytes at all. Instead, it simply exists for when we need a file to which we can write data and have the data just go nowhere and disappear. It sounds a bit odd, but strangely enough, that does actually come in useful sometimes. Honestly, I find the name a bit confusing. Zero and null sound like they're kind of the same thing, though they're not. Null should have probably been called discard or something like that. Now, I think I've been clear that device files, whether they're block files or character device files, or whether they're pseudo device files, they don't necessarily represent stored data. But on the other hand, there has to be some kind of representation for these so-called files. That is, in the dev directory, for every device file, there has to be an entry of this name corresponds to such and such inode, and there has to actually be an inode representing the device file. In the inode stored on the partition is a special indicator that this is not a regular file, this is a device file. So in that sense, device files are stored like other files. It's just there's no stored data associated with their inodes. What we call in Unix a pipe is basically just a single FIFO buffer used as a channel of communication between processes. When a process writes to the pipe, data is appended at the end, and when a process reads from the pipe, data is taken off the front. So when, say, process B wishes to send data to process A, it writes to a pipe, and process A then reads from that pipe. Generally, it makes most sense to treat a pipe as unidirectional, so one process writes and the other one reads. If you want to send data in the other direction, you should use a separate pipe. To create pipes, or in fact to create device files and even regular files, we have a system call called mknode, as in make node. Here, node is used sort of like a generic term for file. When we invoke make node, we specify the name of the file we wish to create, and we specify its type, and in the case of block and character devices, we have to specify the device number. As we'll explain in a later unit, each device in Unix is given a unique device number. Now, again, be clear that these files, though stored as inodes on disk, themselves do not have any data stored with them. So when we write data to a pipe, that data only exists in memory. It is not written to the partition on which we have this pipe file. Now, when you create a pipe in this manner, as we do here with the file Ryan slash Tina, this is what Unix calls a named pipe because it actually has a name. It has a name in some directory. You can also, though, in Unix, create an anonymous pipe, or what's just simply called a pipe, and you do so with the pipe system call. What pipe does is create a new anonymous pipe and returns two file descriptors, each pointing to separate file descriptions, though both of those descriptions are opened on the same pipe. The first one open for reading, the second one open for writing. The idea is that we create a pipe and then fork off another process. Then one of the two processes, either the child or its parent, can write to the pipe using one descriptor, while the other process uses the other descriptor to read from the pipe. And as mentioned, a pipe is usually for one-way communication. So if you want communication in both directions, you should open two pipes.
To be clear, when you create pipes in this way, it's only useful for communication between related processes, that is, two processes where one is a descendant of the other. Because open file descriptors are passed on to child processes, they can both see the same pipe created in this manner. For unrelated processes, you would have to use a named pipe. Another feature of modern Unixes is the ability to map a file, in whole or in part, to pages of memory. What this effectively means is that pages in a process's address space get specially marked such that reads and writes to those pages actually trigger reads and writes to some underlying file. So here, for example, we're opening a file slash brad slash mike, assigning it to a file descriptor f, and then when we invoke mmap to map pages of our address space, we pass in first the number of bytes we wish to allocate, but now we're also passing in a file descriptor and then specifying with a file offset which part of that file we wish to map to memory. So what this call to mmap will do is map the 500 bytes starting at byte 200 in the file to pages in the address space, such that when we now read and write from those addresses, we're actually reading and writing from that part of the file. When done with this work, we should then release the pages of memory and also close the file. Actually, it would have been fine if we'd closed the file after we did the mmap. We don't have to keep the file descriptor around for the sake of the mapped memory. You're probably wondering, what is the point of memory mapped files? Well, it tends to make sense when your reads and writes are not contiguous and clumped together, they're just spread everywhere. When this is the case, it can be considerably easier to write code with a memory mapped file than with regular reads and writes, and also it may end up being more efficient. In fact, depending upon your Unix system and depending upon some options when you invoke mmap, the memory map this way into your process are generally the very same buffers that are usually used when we read and write from files. So this avoids the usual extra work of copying data from your process to the buffer or from the buffer to your process. I would say that memory mapping files is used much less commonly to read and write files than simply using the read and write system calls, but it is something that comes in handy for the programs which can make good use of it. What Unix calls signals are sometimes called software interrupts because they're somewhat analogous to the hardware interrupts sent by hardware devices to the CPU. A so-called software interrupt, however, is sent by the operating system to a process which then must somehow deal with a signal, either by performing a default action associated with that type of signal or by invoking a handler function registered for that signal or possibly by blocking the signal or ignoring it. Blocking here meaning that the signal is queued up until the process then unblocks that type of signal, and ignoring here meaning that the signal is just discarded and totally forgotten. Now, in most modern Unixes, there are between about 30 or 40 different types of signals, and the reasons for why these signals are sent varies from type to type. Many of the signals are sent in the event of some hardware event, especially some kind of error. So, for example, four signals found on all Unixes include SIG SEGV, where SIG of course stands for signal and SEG means segment, as in segmentation fault. Uh, don't ask me what the V stands for actually. And then SIG FPE, where SIG stands again for signal, and FPE means floating point error. And SIG STOP is signal meaning stop, and SIG CONT meaning signal continue. SIG SEGV is the signal usually sent in the event of some memory error, such as when a process attempts to use an address which isn't currently allocated in its address space. The name SEGV, as in segmentation fault, is actually a bit of a misnomer. It's an ar archaic holdover from when memory systems were based around a scheme of segmentation rather than a system based around pages. More appropriately, it would be named something like SIG PAGE F, as in page fault. Instead, we're stuck with SEGV for historical reasons. In any case, when a process is sent the SIG SEGV signal, the default action is to simply abort the process. However, if a process registers a handler for that signal, that is, it registers a function to invoke when that signal is received, then that function will run instead. In the case of a memory error, a process probably should quit because it seems something has gone quite wrong, but by registering a handler for this signal, we can at least run some cleanup code before exiting, say giving us a chance to preserve some important data or something. The SIG FPE signal, the floating point error signal, is usually sent to a process because that process is attempted to divide by zero. When your program tries to have the CPU divide something by zero, the CPU is going to throw a hardware exception, and that's going to trigger the operating system to then send your process the SIG FPE signal. 
And again for this signal, as in fact for most signals, the default action is simply to abort your process, to terminate it. Again, however, if you've registered a handler for this signal, then instead that handler will run when the signal is received. And if appropriate, your handler very well choose to terminate the process, though nothing is forcing it to do so. If you just let the handler return, the process will continue from where it got interrupted. The sig stop signal, as the name suggests, is sent to a process to stop it. The default action when a process receives sig stop is to go into a block state. The process will then only unblock when it receives the sig cont signal. In the case of sig stop and sig cont, these signals are not sent in the event of an error condition. They are sent explicitly from one process to another using the kill system call. Kill allows us to send any signal to a specified process. The name kill very misleadingly implies that signals always kill the processes which receive them, but really that's not the case. It just happens that the default action for most signals is to actually kill the process, to terminate it. Still, kill would have been much more sensibly named something like send signal. It's just one example of a long Unix tradition of stupid crazy names that we've been stuck with for 30 years. Anyway, the two most basic system calls associated with signals are first kill and also signal, which is used to register signal handlers. So here, for example, we're invoking kill to send the sig stop signal to the process 35, and the invocation of signal here is registering for the current process a handler for the signal sig fpe. And the handler is a function which we pass in, here called func. Last thing we'll note about signals is that of course for security reasons you wouldn't want any process to be able to send any signal to any other process. Consequently, unless a process has super user privileges, it can only send signals to processes owned by the same user.